and a personal choice. Uh, that said, getting into academia you know, is also tough just because of <laughs> just because of the job opportunity on the market. Because I realized that uh, we will revisit, like we revisit some of the question about uh, whether we would encourage young folks, uh, students who are who are who might be undergraduate student now, to consider uh, going into academia. If you feel like activist identity or activism is part of your life moving forward, uh, we will talk about it and unpack that uh, at a moment later. But I just stop here. Ooh, the job prospects part. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Jeffrey. Any opening remarks? Yeah. Well, I'm 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 glad you put uh, Alex uh, first because he said a good he said a good uh, sort of uh, openings that 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 I can sort of um, wait. It, is it out of focus? I think it might be out of focus. Anyway, um, hang on one second. All right. Yeah. Okay. Works. Um, well, he 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 set a good stage for 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 me to sort of uh, tell my story because I think there are various points that you know that that it makes sense uh, as it will become clear. But I'll I'll start briefly about like how um, how I became a sort of academic slash um, activist as well. Um, you know, the 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 first protest that I ever went to was in two thousand and three when I was still in primary school. Uh, for Article 23, um, against actually against Article 23, and then um, you know my parents and you know parents took me there. Um, you know throughout the years when I was still in Hong Kong for primary school and then secondary school, um, you know I've been to multiple different protests, like you know against the high speed railway, against uh, patriotic education in 2012. Um, that was actually I think the the last big protest that I ever went to, and then I came to uh, NYU in 2013. Um, and so I've always, you know, by that point been like a decade, but by the time I was in New York, uh, a, a decade as a sort of participant in, in, in Hong Kong's various social movements. But I think the point that really turned me from a participant to an organizer uh, was 2014, was actually during the Umbrella Movement. Um, and it just so happened that in the fall of 2014, uh, I was studying away at NYU's Washington DC campus. So for those of you uh, in the audience, uh, who are at NYU, uh, you, you might want to consider the NYU DC campus for study away uh, if, you, if you don't mind not leaving the US for that semester. Because when I, you know, when I applied in the spring semester, you know, there was, there was you know, talks about 2017 electoral reform, um, but there was no sign that like something like the umbrella movement would, would break out in just a few months. Um, and, 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 and I arrived, I remember, distinctly remember arriving in the last week of August 2014 to DC, um, and like, like within the first few days after I moved into the dorm, um, there was the August 31st uh, decision by Beijing to deny Hong Kongers uh, the right to, um, uh, to elect our chief executive by 2017. Uh, and of course, one of the people uh, who I saw at press conferences speaking, and, and at the time I didn't know him, uh, was Alex uh, and, and his buddies uh, at the Hong Kong Federation of Students. Uh, and then shortly after that, you know, I began to uh, organize various rallies, first in DC and then later on uh, throughout the umbrella movement as well in New York. Um, and, and that was really the semester when I traveled a lot uh, on Greyhound buses because I didn't know how to drive back then, um, you, know, um, you know, organizing solidarity rallies with Hong Kong. Um, and I think 2014 was really the moment when, when, when I, um, you know, became more of an activist, um, you know, obviously US based, not Hong Kong based, um, but doing a lot of these things, getting to know the community, the Hong Kong community um, in both New York and in, in, in Washington. Um, but even, even at that point, um, I did not necessarily see the link between um, my studies and my activism. It, it, was, it started out more as two distinct things. Uh, and, um, and, and by the way, I didn't even know that I was going to necessarily go into graduate school. Uh, it, was, it, it was quite undecided. Um, and when it came time in 2015 for me to decide what to write for my senior thesis, um, I just decided to pick the topic that interested me the most, uh, which was a, a history of popular music, canto pop in Hong Kong. Um, and, and, and that was what I did. And, you know, the, the, the farthest thing from my mind uh, when I began researching topic, researching that topic was to connect that somehow with my activism. Because as I said, I mean, those were really two different things. 
Um, and then something else that Alex just mentioned uh, was me campaigning for Nathan Law in, in, in 2016. I think that was a turning point because by then Demosisto had been founded. Um, I was not yet a, a, a member of Demosisto at the time. Um, but really, I mean, as Alex was saying, a lot of these umbrella movement leaders were trying to think about what to do after the movement um, had ended. Um, and there, there were folks who were thinking of going into academia. There were folks who stayed on the streets. And then Nathan Law was, uh, was the one who decided that he would make change by running for Leshko. Um, and I, you know, I was part of that campaign. Um, and, and, and that was how I spent um, the summer of 2016. And then I came back to New York, you know, continued my master's. Um, and, and, and for those of you who, who were a bit, you know, a few minutes early uh, listening to our conversation just now, I mean, my master's thesis advisor was, uh, was Jane Burbank, who is a Soviet history expert, but not, you know, not having anything to do with Hong Kong. Um, but she taught that class on empires. Uh, and, and, and that was the class that inspired me to write a thesis on, um, on Hong Kong's issue of sovereignty. Um, that combined with, you know, what Demosisto was in 2015, 2016, 2016 actually um, talking about was self-determination. Um, and that was really like a separate discourse from the, the, the rising localist movement within Hong Kong's political context. Uh, and now that I was friends with most people in Demosisto, and by 2017, I would join the political party, um, I was thinking about how to connect what I was learning in the classroom with what we were talking about in Hong Kong when we said we wanted self-determination, when we were thinking about 2047, you know, what was the historical basis of that sort of whole um, um, idea? I think that was really the point when I was trying to connect that with my studies in history. Um, and, and, and that's my, how my sort of master's thesis came to be, uh, which was a sort of uh, uh, um, intellectual backup uh, of some sort, um, you know, for, for what we were talking about in Hong Kong, um, for my, you know, for my political party. Um, at the time, you know, before Nathan was disqualified, we had the seat in the Legislative Council, you know, we had a, we had a team in Hong Kong, um, and we were participating actively in various different debates within sort of Hong Kong's young generation um, space, and, you know, and, and there were you know, various different ideas being thrown around, because the idea in 2014, with the, with the end of the umbrella movement, was effectively um, the death of trying to believe that if you had just followed one country, two systems, eventually there would be democracy. I think you know that was pretty clear by the end of 2014. So um, the idea was to think about well, how best to move forward. What were some of the intellectual basis for for these ideas? Um, and so that was really the moment that that the two connected. Um, and then I would say when I was applying for PhD programs, um, when the time came, you know, I was thinking, you know, if if I should do another project that was explicitly about activism. Um, and for various different reasons, I, you know, that was not what I set out to do. Um, for one, because I had already written like a political history thing I wanted to, I mean, I still wanted to do Hong Kong history, um, but I wanted to focus on something else um, just because, um, you know, you know, to, to, to and, and we can talk more about that in a second, but to, to explicitly brand yourself as an activist has shortcomings when it comes to, uh, academia, because um, some folks uh, might not be necessarily be receptive to that, right? And so, when you know, when when I was uh, doing my, um, I, I spent a year in Toronto in from 2017 to 2018 doing research, um, and that was the year when I was preparing my PhD application, and I was looking at files and archives and reading books about Hong Kong history, thinking about proposing a topic um, that was original enough, um, you know, within the context of Hong Kong history. Um, but also important enough to speak to uh, historians in the U.S. because I was focused on, uh, you know, staying in the U.S. and applying for PhD programs here. Um, the topic that I came came to think about, uh, you know, that, that I decided on doing, I should say, um, was Vietnamese refugees in Hong Kong uh, during and after the Vietnam War, just because the, the topic is so well studied in the U.S. Um, and then the Hong Kong angle to the Vietnam War and the Vietnamese sort of refugee crisis was not that thoroughly studied. And a lot of these documents are still being released. Um, so that was really what I set out to do. Uh, I took three years of Vietnamese uh, in my PhD program uh, at Georgetown. Actually, it, it's Georgetown right now, but I took the, the, the language classes at Johns Hopkins. Um, but, I, but I say all that to, to, to sort of connect the dots together, and I'll end my remarks soon. Um, 
and, and, and here's where the dots connect because when I was um, applying for you know, PhD programs uh, in late 2017 uh, for entry in fall 2018, um, you know, to think about words like refugees or like bold people, I mean, that's distant in a way, not just because it's a topic of historical inquiry, but because, um, you know, Hong Kong was on the receiving end of these refugees uh, because of a war um, in Vietnam. Um, and, you know, there was, you know, there was no way anyone could have imagined what was about to happen in 2019 and 2020 with the national security law. Um, and here we are, you know, in 2022, um, where there are literally Hong Kongers fleeing Hong Kong by boat. And, and, and a few of them ended up in the US. And, you know, in my capacity and in, in Alex's capacity with HKDC, we have had the opportunity to interact with these folks. And so it's, it sort of came full circle because I set out, you know, to work on Vietnamese boat people, refugees, just because I wanted to find something um, that was not, as I said, directly related to my activism. But the changing circumstances of Hong Kong itself meant that thematically, at the very least, what I'm doing for my PhD research, and that research obviously is still ongoing, um, ends up being so relevant to what is happening in Hong Kong right now. You know, Hong Kong has for decades been a safe haven for refugees, you know, whether they were coming from Vietnam in, in, in the case of my study or, um, or, or people fleeing CCP rule after 1949, which was how my grandfather first came to Hong Kong in the 1950s. Hong Kong was always that place where um, refugees came. I mean, Hong Kong did not have a brilliant record on, on embracing all refugees. I mean, there were, there were lots of problems with that, um, but Hong Kong was the destination. Now, Hong Kong is the origin today of refugees, and, and, and that's how it connects to, you know, when I was saying, you know, we are trying to fight in the US Congress for these bills, the immigration bills, the Hong Kong People's Freedom and Choice Act, the Hong Kong Safe Harbor Act, these pieces of legislation that we are working on every day to passing benefits Hong Kongers who are trying to flee Hong Kong because of political persecution in Hong Kong. And not that long ago, Hong Kong was the place where people would go to, right? So, um, so this is what I mean. I mean, it, 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 you know, sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, your, your activism and, and, and what you do in academia, um, you know, these things just connect by themselves, you know, um, because of factors beyond your control. Um, but this is how it played out, uh, it, at least for me and in, in my experiences. And, and, and I'll continue to work on that research project as I will continue to, uh, to work on um, these issues uh, in my advocacy work. Yeah, it sounds like you got a great many things to plug now. But uh, Sharon, do you like to continue? Yeah, uh, since we're already kind of half an hour in, I'll keep my remark brief. Uh, so uh, my trajectory was very different from them. Um, by the time during the umbrella movement, I was already um, in Wisconsin getting my PhD. So I remember that time is a huge dissonance. So it would be in, in, in dissonance in a way that's echoing kind of the 2019 protest in which I would go on campus, teach, lesson plan, and then keep on watching live streams on my phone um, and also accounting for the time difference. Um, so at the time, my uh, what I wanted to study, and I'm always interested in that, is uh, racial inequity related to um, citizenship claims in Hong Kong, and that would became the, the title and topic of my book. Uh, so I think that at the time in graduate school, observing what is unfolding in Hong Kong, and also at the time in Wisconsin, uh, I was participating in union organizing, um, kind of looking at these social movements in parallel terms. I was starting to kind of think about in what ways are these social movements, again, they're very different contexts, but they're both movements that are motivated from people who are on the margin, whose voices were not being heard by the institution to trying to enact social change, right? Uh, so in graduate school, kind of observing that and wanting to think about is it possible for an academic to also play an activist role? So we hear often, especially in my field of rhetoric, uh, we are scholar teacher activists with like hyphenated identities. But more often than not in academia, you're really only being rewarded for the scholar part of how much grant money you're bringing, how much publications that you have, 
the teacher part, depending. If you're in an R1, not so much. And the activist part, definitely not. Like like Jeffrey was saying, like sometimes it's like you view up one and you're a troublemaker. Uh, so when graduate school is really struggling, I was like, I don't know if this is possible. So thought of quitting multiple times. Only did not quit because I'm kind of cowardly and that lie was steady, you know, uh, and had fun day. <laughs> um, so, so I keep trying to figure out in, in what ways and, and so one of the, the question, uh, Alex, that you gave us is that, you know, what defines an academic or activist, right? So I think that, and, and I recently taught uh, current events to my students and asked them too, like, how do you define activism? Like, does it mean that always is in the form of direct action going on the street or can activism take different shape? And so over the years, I've come to understand activism fundamentally is to create social change, is to challenge status quo through by a variety of tactics and organizing, right? In a sense, that goal actually coheres quite well with traditionally what universities are supposed to do, with higher ed is supposed to do before the neoliberalism uh, corporatized university. So university supposed, supposedly in a traditional role is to produce knowledge in a way that is challenge power, in a way that is kind of revisiting, asking folks to revisit the existing paradigm and public discourse agenda. So in that sense, the university can play a very transformative role, much like activism, right? So I think that increasingly what I'm thinking of is that how can I, as an academic, uh, first and foremost, find nooks and crevices within the academic institution, pull from the resources that they have in order to support folks who are doing the on the ground work and how can I, in my research, add value to public discourse about certain topics. Um, so I, I'll just kind of leave it there and uh, let you ask the facilitating questions. Love it, wonderful. So um, I'm gonna send this message that we have some initial topics that we wanna cover. But again, later we'll have a section for audience questions. So please feel free to submit them and we'll take a look at them afterward. But yeah, so first of all, the most general topic question that was honestly framing this entire panel um, was, well, what defines an academic or activist and how do you individually perceive yourself? So what we have here with our panelists are a ton of diplomas. And that's frankly kind of horrifying as an undergraduate student right now. Um, but other discussion topics around it uh, that I put as sub bullet points include like, how do these roles conflict or cooperate? Uh, how do you perceive activist work while you're in the classroom and vice versa? Um, but yeah, feel free to jump on if you have any thoughts and we'll take it from there. I love this part. Okay, I can, I can, yeah, I can, I can go for. It. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's. I mean, it's hard to. Um. I, I think it's easier. I think it's easier to, 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 to think of who is and who isn't an academic. I mean, you know. I think the point that I started to consider myself as an academic was probably when I when I started my PhD. I mean. You know, there's something about getting a bachelor's degree and getting a master's degree that is, you know, I mean, obviously all of that is part of higher ed. Um, but I, I should say there's something distinct about going into a PhD program where, where because, you know, and we can talk a bit more about the job market and stuff in a second if, if we want to. But the P, the whole PhD program is geared, is gearing you toward basically a very narrow sort of career trajectory, which is, which is to, to remain in academia. So I think, I think the point at which I started to, to become comfortable with calling myself an, an academic was when I started my PhD. I think I, I probably began to embrace the activist label, you know, in 2014, um, when, when I, when I played some kind of role in, in organizing a protest and, you know, there's something qualitatively different about, um, actually being a part of organizing a protest and you know, however big or small um, and just showing up to something um, as a participant. And I think 2014 was, was that sort of watershed for me. And, you know, in 2018 was when I entered the PhD program. So I think I became an activist be before I became an academic. 
um, and 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 that might not necessarily be be true for for everyone. Um, but I think you know, in 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 between that, right, between 2014 and 2018, I was participating in various different debates, you know, within the Hong Kong context, as I was saying a moment ago. Um, but I mean, the, the 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 whether those were sort of quote and unquote academic debates, I think is sort of up to. I mean, it 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 is it, it, sort of unclear, right? Because we, you know, we would you know we would we would be talking about things like you know, the, the United Nations decision to remove Hong Kong from the list of um, non-self-governing territories in 1971 and how that UN decision uh, impacted Hong Kong's right of self-determination in the context of the Cold War, right? So, I mean, that is still something that I write about and talk about, um, but but that was probably before I embraced the sort of academic label. But I think, um, yeah, so I, I think I think it's very fluid in, 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 terms, of, in terms of how we define things. Um, but is you know a, a lot of what I'm doing right now would, would would not have been possible you know if not for for those debates that I was you know I was a part of in you know between 2014 you know to 2018. Um, but I think I and 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 everybody everybody else on this panel right now um, should be pretty comfortable with with sort of embracing both uh, by this point both identities. Yeah, I actually want to make a delineation between being an academic and being an intellectual. Um, I think that you don't need to be in academia to be an intellectual. And there are many grassroots folks who have a lot of great ideas from their lived experience and from their organizing efforts. So uh, I think being an academic, in a sense, is a more narrow identity of somebody who is, you know, have a career in university, kind of go through the very hierarchical uh, nature of the institution. And, and so in that case, I think what something that I kind of want to, to think through in case anybody in the audience is interested in being an academic, not just an intellectual, uh, is that, like, like I was saying earlier, there are a lot of through lines that connect supposedly connect the university higher ed with activism, but unfortunately, we do not live in a world where that is the case anymore. And so for, for example, you know, activism is not really like, say, if you want and research one tenure track job, your, your activism will not translate into tenure and promotion. Um, and so university may also not support you. When, if you're an activist work, you likely will get trolled or get attacked at some point. Um, and that can be kind of scary. If you get doxxed and your university doesn't support you, then you're kind of left on your own. Also then wondering, is this academic career that you have spent, you know, sometimes a decade building, it, it's under jeopardy, right? Um, but at the same time, I think that there is this liminal space in academia that in which you can use academic resources to help your activist effort. Uh, so something as straightforward as, for example, in when I was in grad schools working with um, grassroots migrant groups, they don't have a photocopier, they don't have a printer. So I, as a TA, go into my university office and print a bunch of stuff for them, right? So something as straightforward is kind of like almost using tactic, like, you know, making do with what you have. Um, and, and so right now in, in my role as a professor, I would often uh, invite Hong Kong activists, Hong Kong scholars to give talks and then seek out a big honorarium for them through my university. So I think that, you know, we working for neoliberal universities are mainly as employees. Our labor are often not very valued. And so on the flip side, how can we use them back in return to support the movement? And so I'm always kind of thinking about what are some creative ways in which we can use our position uh, to still do the work that we value, even though the institution may not value us. Yes, speaking about like how how scholars or, academ or academics could use the institutional resources uh, to support like activists or activism or social movement on the ground, it just got me to think about uh, like 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 some of the mentors like back in Hong Kong, but I was like still like an undergraduate student in Hong Kong, so uh, like 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 the, the scholarly context or like the academic context in Hong Kong is a very peculiar one, or it might also resonate with like well, 
uh, like academic institution in other places. But uh, uh, what is interesting about Hong Kong's uh, scholarly world while I was still in Hong Kong was that you, you sort of like, well, you sort of like, well, uh, you, you could, you, you'll be able to see like a lot of scholars uh, who are like deeply uh, invested in, in activism, but you also could see like a, like a, a large proportion of scholars who are really indifferent uh, from like well, social issues. They don't really care about like well, what's happening in Hong Kong. They don't write about Hong Kong. They do not research on Hong Kong just because like, well, uh, researching on Hong Kong would, would, not, would not reward them with like a tenure track position or would not get them promoted. But you have like a bunch of like well, uh, activist scholars like well back then in Hong Kong, and what they usually do would like would be like well they would like hire activists as their like well research assistant. Like one prominent example uh, is Eddie Chu. Like Eddie Chu is like well uh, uh, the legislative counselor who got elected in in 2016, but and, and he also like got arrested last year, so he's still now still in custody. Uh, being uh, one of the folks who were like who, who was prosecuted uh, by the government, accusing them of like participating in a primary election in, in 2020. Uh, but like that folk attitude, like he was previously a journalist uh, who report on uh, Middle East conflict. So when he like got back to Hong Kong, he, he was one of the pioneer who led the, the land movement in Hong Kong, the environmental movement in Hong Kong, uh, the preservation movement in Hong Kong. And he did a lot of like community organizing work uh, in the new territories. And, uh, and in 2016, uh, he is like, well, he was one of the leading figure who advocate for the concept of self-determination uh, other than like, well, as, uh, alongside like Demo Sisto and other folks, who are, who are like thinking about an alternative future and an alternative way of like, well, uh, like, well going beyond uh, the idea of one country, two systems. So like he, for quite a while, uh, when he was uh, not elected into the legislature or the district council, he was hired uh, by one like activist scholar in Hong Kong. So like he would be able to like, well, help that professor to research on like, well, social policy in Hong Kong. And, and he would be able to provide a lot of like a very, very like a shoot uh, perspective on how to decide some of the rhetoric uh, used by the government uh, to make a move uh, against the civil society or protest or social movement. Um, so for me personally, I actually like, well, came into the, uh, Western academic institution with that kind of background, having a lot of illusion on like, oh, oh, hey, well, Berkeley might have a lot of like really like well, <laughs> activist type of scholars uh, and, and geography department uh, is branded as one of the most like well active vocal department on campuses. Uh, but that turned out to be like, well, uh, half true and, and, and half false uh, just because like, well, uh, Many, 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 many professors in my department, they are still very like socially motivated. They are still really concerned about like, well, uh, social development, social debates, like policy in the United States and other regions, just because of their research, uh, are concerned about like development issue, uh, ecological future, uh, like the, the dynamic and, and, and the conflict between economy uh, and, and, and nature and that kind of stuff. Uh, but but like for them, like, well, most of the time they spend on is about like researching and, and producing like, well, uh, really high quality research that activists or, or policymaker uh, might, might, might glean through and think about how those ideas and findings uh, would be able to uh, get translated into in the concrete work. So there's like a division or there's like a, there's like a missing link between like, well, being an academic or like a professional scholar and an activist who would really uh, want to propel change and see change on the ground. So I also like, well, took some time to like to adjust myself to see that gap, like while well, being a scholar uh, uh, is not necessarily uh, 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 a public intellectual being vocal uh, on, 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 on current affair or writing op-ed uh, on, on major uh, news outlet. They might have like a different role and different commitment on how they spend their time and how they hand out with students. And, and some professor in my department, 
they would they would see themselves as like well the incubator of like well the next generation of activists, but then themselves might 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 want to like spend more time on reading and researching and thinking instead of like really really doing the concrete work. Just because like well they are in a different position and they might also have like a different inclination and habits on how they see changes uh, coming from them and 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 like producing new ideas or new analysis might be like well part of the contribution that they could think of. Uh, but in recent year, uh, we also see like uh, some changes have been happening like in uh, on U.S. campuses, and I think one prominent example or really obvious phenomenon is like well union organizing like like graduate students like well they are also being like well workers uh, across campuses they're also fighting for like well a, a better uh, teaching compensation uh, in the name of like uh, 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 the cause of like uh, 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 the, like the adjustment of living cost just because like well uh, at, at like right now at this stage, being a graduate student, imagining yourself to be a future professor also struggle a bit uh, on, on financial terms. And, and they might also have a tough time like navigating the job market. And if they want to like, well, uh, like explore or navigate like well, non-academic career track, the training they receive might not equip them well enough to really explore like well, alternative like pathway that might that might get them like well confident enough to to leave the academic institution and go into another expedition. So a lot of like the, the grad students on on U.S. campuses, they've been thinking about like how they could uh, get more protection by like organizing among themselves, by unionizing, uh, by thinking about strike, so they could like well uh, uh, like what pressure on uh, the university administration to think about how the administration should allocate their budget annually so that like well you could like well, grad student and other like well researchers they could get more protection i think like uh, like well just going along with this trajectory uh this kind of new phenomenon or movement like happening on u.s campuses might also like well uh give new perspective or, or blend in like the identity of like being activist and being you know being a future scholar at some point in the future just because like well being a grad student or, or, or a scholar to be, uh, it no longer guarantee you like a, a middle class life, like well, in a prosperous future. You, you might also struggle and you also have to think about like well, how you could really uh, materialize your intellectual input into uh, a materially secure future through like well, union organizing, uh, through securing more protection by being a grad student. So at one point in the future, like well, by, by being a professor, uh, uh, there are like more chances, like well, given to you. So it is also a very peculiar moment, uh, being on U.S. campuses, like being a grad student, uh, being being uh, a teaching assistant, or even like well, uh, being like a, 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 a like well, uh, 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 like a, a junior scholars who aspire uh, to secure a tenure track uh, position uh, in the academic setting. <laughs> we are very far off of where I wanted the next question to go, but I'm going to very awkwardly bring us back because earlier, I think maybe Jeffrey mentioned that one of the initial questions was about uh, encouraging an activist to be an academic or vice versa. And connected to that, like what I think Sharon mentioned earlier as well, like what can you do in your academic work that you can't as a non-academic activist or conversely, what are the limitations of academic work? If anyone has thoughts, feel free. I kind of want to kind of, in order to kind of transition coherently, right, uh, connect to what Alex kind of ended his remark on. Uh, I think if we kind of think about activism and academic work, it's almost like mutually exclusive. It's not necessarily a productive way to, to frame this. So I think like what Alex made clear is that increasingly, academic workers, and yes, academic are workers too, right? Academic workers are organizing and we're thinking, we're not no longer have this image that we are in the ivory tower, like very late day, thinking about just knowledge all day, because that's just not our reality. Um, even if you are a tenured professor, you are still always dealing with systems of power that are uneven. You're still always dealing with institutional status quo, 
um, that in ways small and big perpetuate inequities that we are kind of seeing politically even outside the university, right? So in a sense, the university is a proto-public uh, that is not by no means a utopia. So I think that academics and activism increasingly now, especially during the COVID pandemic that we saw more social movements coming up, have this kind of intimate uh, connection be between the two. So, but that said, um, I think, for example, in, in my case as an academic, I think one way that as beneficial is that I am now able to reach audiences that otherwise I might not have reached. So for example, during the protest, 2019 protest and the aftermath, I have basically almost every single week, I am giving invited lectures to a variety of universities. And partly because it's a pandemic, so then we can just Zoom, no, no, nobody needs to fly anywhere. Um, and so I, I also see these kind of public speaking and teaching in as a form of activism, uh, partly to inform an audience students and faculty members who may not be aware of what is happening. Uh, and also I think primarily is that what I want to get out and use this is also using my academic training is to help them make connections. So I think that it's one thing for them to hear about Hong Kong and they're like, oh, this is really sad, but cool story moving on, right? But it's another thing to help them understand why what is happening to Hong Kong is also intimately connected to the politics that we're seeing in the States, the geopolitical tension between the US and China, and also um, more broadly speaking, uh, connection within the transnational systems of power. So I think that partly I'm using my academic training and my teaching experience to help get these points through to an audience who may previously not been making these connections. Yeah, I, I, I think I have a lot of sort of similar ideas as well. I think, you know, uh, you know, the, the sort of dissonance, Sharon, that you were talking about earlier, right? I, I, I think that was, that, you know, that happens, you know, in, in 2019, you know, you, you would be tuning into like Stan News Live and looking at protesters being beaten up with, in the wrong time zone. And then, and then you have to go back to read this book for tomorrow's seminar on 16th century France, and 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 that was that was mind blowing, and 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 that was not very, a very happy time. But sometimes, you know, professors, even though who are you know even those who are not on in your field or like your students in TA, you know, when I was TA, knowing that you know you you're from Hong Kong, they would ask you questions about Hong Kong, and um and they would tell you all kinds of connections that they have with Hong Kong, like maybe. They used to live in Hong Kong, you know, or they they've been there for vacation. They have memories of watching Hong Kong films or whatever. I think I think those are the moments when 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 certain things connect and and and, and that allows you to talk more about what you do. Um, but but despite all that, I I, I should say uh, that you know that there are areas um, of connection. Um, and and I'll give you two quick examples. Um, one was when I was working on my master's thesis that I talked about earlier, a history of Hong Kong's sovereignty and self-determination. Um, I was able to go to London for the UK National Archives, where most of the pre-1997 documents were stored. Um, and as a master's student at NYU, I mean, I you know I applied to like two, three grants. I got a couple of hundred dollars, which is pretty good for for a master's project. Um, but but obviously never enough if you you know if you're going to do it like a serious historical inquiry into like a large topic that requires international traveling, um, and the way that I was able to do it was because at Demosisto we actually worked with a, a different institution in Hong Kong uh, to do a project called Decoding Hong Kong's History, and we did crowdfunding, and we had um, we had large sums of money that were you know that we could use for traveling and uh, and lodging while we were in London. So I actually made a couple of trips. And I think I did. I think I did more archival work than most uh, master student would on a history paper, just because I could tap into resources from Hong Kong's civil society on that project that was about um, self determination, right? That was about political debates that were going on at the time in 2017 in Hong Kong. Um, but I was able to use those resources for those documents that I could cite in my master's thesis. Um, and I think I, you know, and 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 I think I was able to do that because I had sort of one foot step steeped in, in sort of Hong Kong's activist network and then the other in, in my academic work at NYU. Um, and, and, and this is, you know, this is when I, I used sort of uh, 
you know, quote unquote, used uh, sort of activist resources for academic purposes. And then the second example is sort of vice versa, right? Being, uh, you know, at Georgetown and previously at NYU, I mean, just just being part of an, a university institution um, allows you to, uh, as Sharon was saying a, a little earlier, I mean, allows you to reach a different audience, you know, in, in your academic work and in your activism. And what we've been doing in the past uh, two months or so, uh, and this is not unique to Georgetown, but some of you uh, in the audience might know, you know, there's various different universities right now working on divestment campaigns uh, for the university endowment to pull out of uh, companies, investing in companies uh, that are complicit in Uyghur forced labor. Uh, and in my capacity uh, as a Georgetown graduate student, I was able to meet with you know, these much brighter undergraduate students who are championing this and, and sort of helping them find, identify faculty members who might be supportive of that um, and, and identifying graduate students who might be supportive of that as well. Um, and so this is a Georgetown-based campaign directed at the Georgetown administration, but it is also tied to Uyghur forced labor. And that is tied to the broader issue of CCP uh, authoritarian expansion. Uh, expansionism, right? And and these are issues that I work on in my capacity as an activist, um, but I'm able to translate that into a university context uh, and, 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 and get to know activists uh, on campus as well, even those who are not necessarily um, very involved otherwise in the China issue. issue. So I think, uh, I think it, you know, being able to, to sort of blend things in, um, I think can, can be important and, and, and can deliver results from time to time. Um, I also want to say, I think, I think you know, for, for those of you who might go to graduate school or, or thinking of, you know, um, you know, going to a PhD, I mean, you know, academic institutions are very bureaucratic. They can be, they can be, um, you know, they can be brutal, right? You know, in, in, in terms of that, you know, um, I, I, I think the most important advice that I, I, I think people should, should get um, is to find yourself a, a, a supportive uh, advisor. Um, so your advisor is the main person responsible for your success in the PhD program in a way that is not the case in, in college, right? No one professor is so crucial to your, you know, entire experience, but, you know, at PhD, you know, it's really your advisor and then your committee of three to four professors. Most other people don't matter, right? If, if, if you have an advisor who is sympathetic to your activism, it goes a long way just to be flexible with things and, and things do come up. Um, right and and uh, and on the other hand, if you don't have a professor who is very sympathetic to what you do outside of academia, um, you might find yourself even more locked in in terms of what you can do and can't do. So, um, you know, so so you know, Berkeley as an institution has this sort of reputation of 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 being you know of 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 having a very strong sort of activist student activist culture, you know. Um, but but there are also professors who are totally apolitical and un unsympathetic to that at Berkeley. In the same way, Georgetown has this reputation of being very pro-establishment in terms of, you know, uh, you know, very you know, very well connected to the State Department or the CIA or whatever. Is a very it has that kind of reputation, especially the School of Foreign Service, right? Very elitist, very sort of military industrial complex related thing. Um, but there are also professors who are very rebellious, right? And there are also professors who can support you. So at the institution, that definitely matters. Um, but on a day-to-day -day level, um, having a supportive network of professors um, who will allow you to do what you want to do, you know, whether as an activist or an academic, I think that's the most important thing. Yeah, go, going along with Jeffrey's point, I could also talk a bit about uh, like um, my 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 relationship with my advisor. I think like well, uh, I think uh, uh, she she has been like a very like supportive uh, figure like well in my academic journey, like despite like well she being like well really harsh and 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 really like well strict or like, well, uh, like, well, uh, academic standard and academic expectation, but like, well, uh, she being a person who uh, research on China and, 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 and to like the witness, like, well, all the unfolding on like, well, urban and rural transformation in China. And uh, she, she is like, well, being like, well, really considerate 
about like well uh, uh like like her students well-being and, and what's happening in hong kong and, and 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 the suffering and the trauma that we might be facing uh so so in the process of in the process of like discussing with her uh, on my like uh, on, on on my on my dissertation topic on my phd studies progress well she, i think like what she exercised uh really strong empathy and 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 capacity in, in supporting her student in thinking about like well what might be the right dissertation topic if the previous one doesn't work and if you really want to align your like well um, activist interest with a scholarly interest then uh whether that is possible and 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 how far could you go we also have this kind of like really honest conversation about like well uh like what topic might really uh be considered as successful in the academic setting and that might also have some like social meaning and social values in your research uh so i feel like uh uh like having a really strong uh, mentor uh if you decide to go into graduate school uh, that person or that set of people they might dictate your experience of being in, in grad school or even like well uh, on your decision about like whether you're gonna stay in academia or, or to flee from academia <laughs> and, and then land uh, uh, somewhere else. But uh, just, I just want to like uh, to end call, like what, what Jeffrey has said. And, and, and yeah, just one last point is like, I feel like, like scholars, they, they usually play like a really supporting role uh, in, 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 in Hong Kong's social movement. And that's the case in, in Hong Kong. Sometimes they might also like well take a lead, uh, but like I think like well today especially like well in in such a uh, dire situation like well uh, many like well uh, Hong Kong studies uh, scholars or scholars who are sympathetic over like well Hong Kong's situation, they are really trying to like be supportive uh, to to recruit more students that would like to do Hong Kong studies or or or, or to provide like a teaching or to share information and resources uh, whenever they're reached so that they could like well, protect Hong Kong uh, uh, through, 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 another, through, another, through another way of coming in. Just a last remark, um, again, as in my role, ever since I got tenured, I think I started thinking also about my academic career and activism differently. One is I kind of quote unquote like made it. So, so one way I'm thinking is that, you know, Yes, getting tenure matters because you get paid more money and you have more job security. But I'm also always thinking like, how can we make use of the position of power that we have earned to do that? And, and I think one way that, you know, what, what Alex and, and Jeffrey were both saying is that um, there are not a lot of senior scholars, uh, especially in humanities, social sciences, who are right now also say have a diasporic uh, Hong Kong experience or have experience supporting simultaneous in academic career and activism. Um, and so in however limited way that I can, I am um, mentoring graduate students and junior faculty in, in that role. So I'm just gonna like, whoever is here, if you're thinking of grad school and have some questions about when you become an academic, what's life's gonna be like? I'm more than happy to chat with you. Uh, and I will drop my email in the in the chat if any of you have questions afterwards that um, would want to ask. Yeah, that's really funny because I'm one of those people fleeing academia after I'm done here. But <laughs> um, I'd like to jump to this other question that you've all brought up this morning on is that, you know, the current situation of Hong Kong academia, uh, you know, Hong Kong academics have been facing a lot, honestly, quite a lot in the last few years. Um, do you see your own selves as having a role in supporting uh, Hong Kong academics, whether it be because of uh, the path you chose in higher education or your role as a quote unquote activist or both? Um, some examples that have been brought up uh, include uh, sociology professor UCLA, Ching Kuang Li, uh, who used to be the chairperson for Society of Hong Kong Studies. Um, Lo Wing Sung, uh, adjunct professor of cultural studies, who was fired in October. Uh, and Johannes Chan, Tan Man, Tan Man Man, who is retired, quote unquote, by HKU in July after he expressed sympathy for the July 1st stabbing attack, um, 
sorry, after he said that expressing sympathy for the attacker, including mourning, uh, cannot be illegal, um, which was a claim that uh, the Hong Kong uh, administration tried to make. So he was retired from this position at HKU in July. But, you know, some examples that were pretty recent, honestly, and that is a look at the scene of academia while in Hong Kong. Like, I think y'all have brought up some stuff about that as well, if you'd like to expand. Yeah, so um, so this this professor um, was denied entry to Hong Kong. I, I'm blanking on his name right now. I was trying to Google, but I <laughs> didn't have enough time. Anyway, um, so this guy, I think about two, three weeks ago, was 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 denied entry to Hong Kong. Uh, he's also affiliated with uh, with with a um, Human Rights Watch, and then the head of the Human Rights Watch had. I think a year or two ago, also been barred from entering Hong Kong. So there was a lot of international attention on this, this case. Um, and I bring it up because, um, because I, was, I, I did an interview, I think with the Times of Higher Education or, or, or whatever, a few days ago, and I was asked about this case. And obviously, in, in, in every way is wrong, right? You know, the, 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 it, um, you know, to bar an academic from going into Hong Kong. And, um, and I was you know, approach for that interview, obviously, because I was an academic and also an, an activist. Um, but I used that opportunity when speaking to the to the reporter to say, well, it's not an isolated incident. And, you know, and this is is not always uh, very helpful if a, you know, if an in, if a foreign scholar is denied entry to Hong Kong, and then there's a lot of international media attention on that particular case. Um, but all these locally based Academics, they also face the repression of, you know, of, of of Beijing because of reduced academic freedom, and then they never get any attention, right? So that was the point that I was trying to get at to the reporter. I said, you know, it's good that you're doing this story, um, but don't forget about all these other names that you will never hear uh, on the international uh, media, in including, you know, what you, the, the the few names that were that were being um, mentioned a moment ago. Um, and and so I think it's important, at least for me and 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 for those of us who have that kind of platform because of our activism. And 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 this is also something important, right? Because you know, because of my activism, having previously worked with Joshua Joshua Wong, who is of course also in jail right now, um, I was able to um, publish in all these um, media outlets that I independently would otherwise have uh, have a very low chance of being able to do so, but. And, and also media contacts that we get because of us being activists. I think it's important for us to utilize that um, and, and, and shed light on, on issues uh, about um, local academia as well. And, and, and I think that particular quote that I gave to the reporter for that story, I think that ended up uh, being printed in the story. So it just goes to show you how even though an incident is about um, foreign academics, you can still use that spotlight and, 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 and help you know, and help reporters understand better what is going on on the ground in Hong Kong. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's very difficult because, you know, you, you know, even in the U.S. academia system, as everybody here know, uh, should know by now, you know, achieving tenure is right, you know, as Sharon uh, said, right, it, it means like you've made it, right, and, 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 and that sort of, um, that comes with the job security, you know, um, and 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 all of that, you know, within the U.S. context, and and not having atta attained that is, you know, puts you in a far more vulnerable position um, within the context of of U.S. academia. Um, but the situation in Hong Kong is always far worse, right? Like even, you know, even fewer people can can obtain tenure in in Hong Kong, and and tenure in Hong Kong means far less than tenure in the U.S. Just because, um, you know. The, the the university administration um, is 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 so sort of controlled by the Hong Kong government. You know, it, it in a way like how these massive public schools in the U.S. You know, in Texas, in Florida, in states uh, with very conservative governors, often you know whether on stuff like um, you know professors speaking out on racial issues or like mask mandates, like a lot of these cultural war issues. Um, you know, professors who work in large state institutions are vulnerable than private institutions, right? Like Georgetown or NYU. Um, and, and, and it's the same way, but much worse in Hong Kong, where virtually all universities in Hong Kong are public, quote unquote, public universities, 
Um, and so, um, you know, the board, you know, the, the chancellor, chancellor, et cetera, they are all um, um, sort of being held accountable by the, Hong, by, by the Hong Kong government, right? And, and so it's, you know, it's just very difficult. And, and, and the last thing I want to say is, you know, and, and Alex, uh, Alex Chow said this at the outset, right? A, a lot of us, when, when we first set out to uh, pursue a doctoral degree, or I should say, yeah, most of us, not, not all of us, but most of us, right, at least um, had in the back of our mind um, imagined the possibility of getting our PhDs in the U.S. and then returning to Hong Kong to begin our academic career there. And the fact that the national security law uh, was enacted in 2020 means that that possibility is totally shut out uh, for, for many of us. And so the reality uh, by the time we get our PhDs would be a very different um, sort of scenario than when we first entered it. And it's like a five, six, seven year, if not longer process. And a lot can change within that period in, you know, in your personal life, but also in the broader sort of social condition. Um, and so, um, and, and so that, you know, there's a cost to that too, right? For people who, the whole point of going to a PhD program is to be able to go back to Hong Kong and become a professor and teach Hong Kongers. I mean, if that is no longer an option, you know, that can feel very disorienting. And, and, and that is not a cause that people um, talk about enough. Very real quick, thank you to a very helpful audience for submitting the name of the professor that was denied entry. I'm just gonna paste the link in the chat real quick. Yes, Ryan Thorson, Thorson. yeah, that's him. So I think I'll follow up on what Jeffrey's saying. Yes, the part about not being able to teach in Hong Kong again, especially since we teach social science, humanities, we talk about issues of power. I think it may be a different story if we're in the STEM field. Uh, I have several professor friends in Hong Kong in gender movement studies, and they have to navigate so many different barriers to protect themselves and protect their students in a class. So then you think about how can you teach power and social movement under a context of censorship and, and repression. Uh, and, and again, I really like uh, Jeffrey's uh, example of how to talk to the media. So I think like those of us who get a lot of press inquiries, that is another thing where being an academic activist give you that advantage of exposure that we can in however big or small way shape the lens that the public discourse is focusing on a little bit. Uh, so absolutely the point is that I think in, in a lot of the times, academic freedom in the States is very nationally focused. So I'm not saying that uh, US academic freedom is not under siege, it is. Like I teach in a predominantly white conservative state school, um, so even though I have tenure as a person of color and an immigrant, it's still pretty precarious, right? But I think what Jeffrey's point is that um, the kind of, we can kind of maybe nudge mainstream U.S. audience into thinking about the context in the U.S. as echoing and similar to that in Hong Kong. Again, during that connection without kind of lumping them in together and conflating them. So uh, I, I think one, one problem that we are now seeing is that if scholars in Hong Kong are prevented from conducting research and teaching in ways that will promote social change, and those who have fleed may be in exile and not being able to return safely to conduct research, so then we have to really reimagine what research methodologies can we now use to, to uh, promote Hong Kong studies. Uh, and also we may even that means that we will have to re-envision the kind of research questions that we can ask and interrogate if we have facing so many restrictions. So I think that there, that actually is some conversations that uh, Hong Kong Studies Association have been having about what is the praxis of Hong Kong studies under uh, NSL. Uh, uh, a couple of points that I have in mind. Uh, like given the current situation is uh, whether whether like well uh, like U.S. universities or like other uh, academic institution in the liberal world could provide like some some protection to scholars who are fleeing Hong Kong because like many scholars like 
who taught in Hong Kong or uh, in a tertiary institution in Hong Kong, uh, many of them actually have relocated to Taiwan to continue their, their teaching and their like well, academic career. Like uh, like a couple of them like well uh, announced that it might be like a a, a, a temporary uh, a teaching in Taiwan. Like uh, Kim Man Chan, uh, one of the founders of the Occupy Central movement. And there's another like well vocal scholar who taught uh, at Lingnan University on like well uh, decolonization, post-colonial theory. Uh, he is like one of the most like prolific writers like well, uh, writing on on the Sunday Ming Pao on like uh, uh, current affairs in Hong in Hong Kong. I think he he's, he also like recently moved to Taiwan, and uh, like I I remember like a, a few years back then I think that was two thousand. Uh, 18, uh, Jerry Coham, uh, like one of the very like well, prominent law scholars on, on China studies uh, who taught at NYU. I think he's now retired, but he might still be uh, giving out uh, 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 lectures or seminars uh, from time to time. He, he, he once joked saying if Benny Tai uh, got arrested and got sacked, uh, he might just like well uh, hire him and, and, and give him like a, a visiting uh, profession, pr professorship in, 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 in NYU, uh, it could no longer be the case just because like, oh, Benny Tai is still in custody. Uh, but like, well, there are some like well, friendly scholars like well, uh, outside Hong Kong uh, who would be able to provide that kind of protection to ensure like, well, scholars who research and passionate about Hong Kong and Hong Kong's future would still be able to like well, research on, uh, study, and teach uh, Hong Kong as a subject, like well, to, to folks like outside Hong Kong, as, as a way to like well, protect and support uh, Hong Kong's movement or Hong Kong's civil society. And one thing that is on the back of my mind is like, uh, I think in the recent months, like starting from last year, especially after the passing of the national security law, many folks in Hong Kong are thinking and considering how they could like well, uh, like uh, transfer and. Uh, relocate some of the archive, uh, archival materials in Hong Kong uh, about the, the civil society of Hong Kong uh, and, 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 and transfer them, get them shipped uh, to other places because like they could imagine like, well, at some point in the future, uh, those archives, uh, which are about like the civil society of Hong Kong might just get burned and they might get like, well, deleted and destroyed and, and you might, no longer have way to like well, retrieve uh, the textual data just because like all those documents uh, will be gone at, at some point. So so that kind of work like well transferring archives like uh, from Hong Kong to somewhere else. It is also an, an ongoing effort uh, to link uh, uh, the academic setting uh, with the civil society in Hong Kong. So those are just like some examples that, that I have in mind. That might also be like a collective effort being done by people uh, trying to focusing on like well how they could like well bridge the two sides. So like well uh, the scholarly world could also be supportive uh, to what's going on in Hong Kong. Yeah, I'm thinking a lot about the archive question because I'm taking a history capstone course right now. Anyways. Uh, one reminder for everyone that you can submit questions into the Q&A. Uh, so one more question from me, and then we'll move to some audience questions. But uh, my question right now is uh, a lot of prominent Hong Kong activists abroad are quote unquote academics, honestly, with multiple diplomas, like all of you terrifying smart people. And there was definitely a period of time uh, where people were looking at the protests, looking like, oh, they're so polite and refined. And even though they might, those two things might not be directly correlated, I'm wondering if you have thoughts on how the movement is presented outside of the city. Uh, what maybe, what role do respectability politics play in this? And were activists who weren't academics just not get that much attention from media? Or is there another uh, factor to this that is not so directly obvious? Um, I would go ahead and, and kind of talk about why respectability politics can be the most harmful for people who are marginalized. Uh, so in the US context, respectability politics have been 
harnessed and used against especially black people, people of color, essentially saying that respectable policy saying that, you know, you have to be respectful in order for the state, the those in power to listen to you. Uh, you have to be respectful when you uh, air your grievances. But the point is that when marginalized people are respectful, their voices are never heard. Their perspectives are not taken into account. So um, the, hence, when there is an uprising, often from people of color, or even say from queer people thinking about Stonewall, immediately when they're vilified is being vilified as, so oh, you're unruly, right? You're not respect, respectful and respectable. And hence, what you say should be ignored. And so I think that is an extremely harmful framework that is often used to maintain status quo. Um, and I think in, in the US, uh, in the Hong Kong context, kind of, kind of thinking those terms together, uh, there have been kind of during the Black Lives Matter uprising, there have been kind of discourse comparing, oh, Hong Kong protesters are a lot more polite and hence these Black rioters you know, we shouldn't kind of build solidarity because one is a group of rioters that, you know, resource to looting. But on, on the other hand, with Hong Kongers who are respectful, um, kind of, you know, more quote unquote well behaved, I think that all those arguments are deeply racializing and, and, and especially steeped in, in anti blackness. And so, in the respectability politics then is also pitching one marginalized group against the other, basically weighing which one of you are closer to the norm of whiteness and civility. And so when, when you do that, it, it essentially kind of creates it, creating this kind of lose-lose situation because, you know, more of the power actually comes from that shared struggle. But if we're using respectability politics, it became more of a divide and conquer on the side of those who have power. Alex, do you want to go first? <laughs> sure. Uh, I res respectable respectable polity. Um, I think uh, that I just feel like like the, the question about uh, respectability. It kind of like got me back to like well, twenty nineteen. Uh, when 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 the 2019 uh, uprising was out, I think it, there was like an intense debate between like well uh, some mainland Chinese students and then Hong Kong students on like well uh, whether the the movement should remain uh, calm and polite and, and nonviolent and 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 whether folks in Hong Kong should engage in any uh, quote unquote uh, vandalism. Uh, uh, destroying uh, the gate, uh, 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 the window of the legislative council, uh, whether folks should like put on a gravity on the wall, uh, uh, whether uh, folks should like, well, uh, like just wipe out all the posters after they protest on the street. So you have like that kind of debate and, 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 and discussion back in, uh, in 2019. Uh, it seems like, uh, like that being a strategy back in Hong Kong, uh, folks were also concerned about uh, what might be the impact and how uh, would the image of the of the movement uh, got translated uh, into uh, the media reporting. And as far as I could recall, there's a there's a split, and there's never been a consensus on. Um, Right, right. Also, yeah, yeah, yeah. I also heard the the the, the choppy sound uh, a, a, a moment ago. So, so is this still happening or? On and off. Don't worry about it. Keep going. Okay. I don't think it's okay. a big problem. Uh, yeah, I was just talking about like the split amount amount of participants back in 2019. I felt like there was like never there was never a consensus on like well what might be the best strategy. And how do you present yourself uh, in the face of journalists and also like well, uh, like well, uh, uh, like onlookers who are like viewing and evaluating the movement? Uh, but folks, I feel like 
many folks uh, did have in mind, like, well, uh, the tactics and strategy that they adopt uh, would have a direct impact on like other local audiences as well, like other folks who might disagree uh, with the democratic aspiration in Hong Kong and also the democratic movement in Hong Kong. So I think I feel like like many folks are not just like well uh, uh, paying attention to like well how the outside world might be might be might be looking at Hong Kong. They're also concerned about how their peers, uh, their colleagues, or their neighbors would react to their strategies. So sometimes folks might take like well uh, uh, like well the way of presenting and behaving into consideration, so that they feel like they would be more able to like well persuade others. Uh, 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 to, 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 to be sympathetic over the movement. Uh, but like, I feel like it is easy to, like on a movement level, it is easy to uh, discuss and, and debate what might be the best strategy. But when you are on the ground, uh, on the street, it could always be very emotional. And sometimes or at times it's really hard to like well, discern uh, what might be the best move when you see like, well, police uh, beating up your friends, your colleagues or elderly or children and, and, and folks got chalked off because of like a tear gas spreading across the city. Uh, that would be like a really, like a different scenario and a diff different, uh, difficult conversation that folks might be having. So I would say like, I don't have like a really uh, good answer towards like well, how we should approach this type of politics. But like, well, uh, there's indeed a danger, like a red flag that we should be aware of, as Sharon has rightly pointed out, like, well, like this kind of respectability politics, it might always involve uh, power abuse and, and power move uh, that might be capitalized uh, on, on people uh, who might be uh, thinking differently. Uh, but but that's like a like a whole like well uh, 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 different terrain that that uh, it, it might worth like well uh, another whole panel to discuss just because it is such a big topic when you want to pinpoint uh, the really uh, nitty gritty of, of the topic and also like well, the specific example that folks have, have in mind when they uh, make different kind of remarks and comments. The the issue of the kind of the tension they were always navigating here when we are in the diaspora kind of straddling two contexts is that how do we do this translation and the translation often is imperfect but the issue becomes this imperfect translation hinges upon such high political stake and emotional stake that it's sometimes like you, you cannot even use language to explain your embodied experience of being in Hong Kong locally or being in the U.S. as a person of color. Uh, so, so I think that's something that we'll always grapple with and maybe increasingly so uh, as the diaspora grows. And, and I do know that we want to kind of move into uh, Q&A. So, so the second question that somebody in the audience asked, uh, I do want to address that. Uh, so the question is, when you as an activist have strong opinions on political issues, how do you write or talk about it, um, it suddenly disappeared. Oh, okay, it's clicked that it's answered. Um, how do you talk about these issues in a rational way that fits the academic purpose and how do you make sure others who trust you uh, to treat those who have opposite political views fairly in your academic role, such as mainland Chinese students who support the CCP? So I want to address these questions because I've kind of encountered these scenarios multiple times. Um, one is that I don't necessarily think that our emotional investment as an activist is con will contradict the way that we analyze an issue as an academic. So I think it's almost like a false dichotomy to think that if we're an activist and emotional, then we're irrational, that that is not the case. And also we are an emotional investor because that's important for us. And I think that increasingly there's more publication space in academia that allow for activist scholarship in a way that, you know, we can express progressive politics. Uh, but, but again, um, even outside of the Hong Kong context, when I, I teach um, race and gender, again, I've mostly been teaching in white state schools, and now in, in Kentucky is a red state, so, so it, I'm always kind of thinking about how can I teach in a way 
that hold true to my principle and my political beliefs, but at the same time, not alienize students who may not share the same view, right? So um, an example is that I, I've been giving so many of these talks to different universities, and there are audience members who are Chinese nationalists and would challenge me and be like, why are you saying this? Are you sure you're right? You know, um, aren't those Hong Kong protesters just like destroying order? So a lot of these different arguments but I think that when I am giving the lecture through the lens of kind of social movement studies, I am not always trying to change minds because it's unlikely that just reading an article or hearing a lecture will change someone's mind that have been socialized for years. But at the very least, I want to make the room for us to at least have this deliberation, at least to present an alternative view. Um, I also have a kind of like on a more uplifting note, I have after giving these talks, received emails from mainland Chinese students who had said that, you know, previously haven't thought about it that way because we are, they are also in like an information bubble. They're only kind of seeing one side. And again, this is also true, true in the US with a more polarizing social media structure. So the talk then allow them to ask more questions. So I think it's always striking a fine balance between not capitulating to what quote unquote like neutral unbiased view because they, there is no such thing as unbiased. But at the same time, holding open the space for whoever is listening or reading to engage with the ideas that we're putting forth on their own terms. Since we moved into Q&A, uh, Alex Jeffrey, if you have any thoughts on this question, feel free to jump on. I have some thought on, on the first question about, um, do we see any possibilities to organize from uh, okay, the question, wait, from academia overseas that can still have an impact on local organizing, what are some examples of that from your perspective, what kind of impact have these efforts made? Uh, so I, I want to like answer that question just because, uh, uh, it is a tough question, uh, but I also see that like, well, some folks uh, overseas and, and folks who are in the academia, uh, like like some of them have been like, well, trying to like engage in union organizing for, for a couple of years. And, and what they have in mind is like, well, the labor organizing uh, uh, back in the 2019 movement, when some folks like, well, started to organize on campuses uh, in the US and, uh, what they're thinking is like, oh, there was like a wave of like a new independent union uh, being set up like back in 2019 and 2020. Uh, unfortunately, like well, most of them got wiped out and, and, and dissolved uh, in recent months. Uh, but some folks like, well, they, they have been thinking about how they could like expand the network and tap into the network that could really like well, translate and bring back uh, uh, the experience, the techniques, the vision, and, and, and some of the organizing principles like back in Hong Kong. Uh, but after the passing of the national security law, it seems like, well, this kind of like, well, uh, cross sector or, or, or transnational effort uh, become uh, harder and harder to achieve just because like, well, uh, folks who are uh, straddled uh, between the two worlds uh, who are like organizing in the overseas space and would like to contribute to the Hong Kong context, uh, they might they might they might put themselves at risk of like well being seen as like well subverting the state or, or colluding with like external forces, uh, just as like uh, what what the labor union uh, organizing movement uh, encountered in China in, in the past few decades. So like that route, uh, uh, like the chance of like making that route successful, uh, the chances might 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 getting like well uh, 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 like just. Uh, slimmer and slimmer. It is just like becoming more, 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 more gloomy. Uh, but like, what, 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 like, why do you think like, well, their work is important? Is because it seems like, uh, for for the very moment, like many folks inside and outside Hong Kong, we are thinking about how how to how to how to how to self help, uh, how how to self govern, uh, how how to like well support one another. Uh, when when the Hong Kong government and the Chinese government clearly they're like well failing uh, 
uh, they're selling this, their citizens and they could not uh, represent like well folks on the ground to be like the true like representative then like uh, how folks uh, from the diaspora in the civil society could really like uh, put together their experiences like their their expertise uh, uh, their their skill sets in in, in self organizing in 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 establishing like diasporic organization uh, to really like uh, uh, teach about Hong Kong's story uh, Hong Kong's history uh, preserve Hong Kong's culture uh, rebuild Hong Kong's Hong Kongers identity from afar. So uh, that kind of like organizing experiences on U.S. campus, I also view them as like part of that collective effort in rebuilding a civil society from afar. And and why that is important is because like well, uh, when when the government or the state when they are failing, uh, you need like well uh, the non-state actors and non-state folks, uh, which meant. Uh, many of the liberal institution, once playing a strong role in Hong Kong, they have to be revitalized uh, uh, in the diasporic spaces. And, and, and that kind of work is extremely crucial and, and productive and peripheral uh, when we anticipate a certain transformation in the future. And that kind of effort has to start from today. Uh, but, but, but realistically speaking, it could hardly be uh, translated, directly translated into the Hong Kong's context today, just because like, well, folks might want to like stay away from like, well, being affiliated uh, uh, as like external forces. Uh, so that route, uh, like, well, it is getting difficult, but it also has as uh, a meaning in doing that kind of work. Yeah. Um Wait, so when I answer these audience Q&A questions, can, can the audience themselves also see what questions are being answered? Or is it just- I'm gonna click answer live so that they can be viewed. Okay, um, well, what, I, mean, I mean, there are two left. I think that the Lam Chao question, I think probably all of us have, have something to say about that. So why don't I answer the one directed to me first? Um, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, okay. So, so, so that is the, a question about Canto Pop, which is, you know, as I was reading that, obviously, uh, thinking back at, you know, when I was writing my undergraduate thesis at NYU. Um, I'll, I'll answer that in the, in, as a historian, and I'll try to link it back to, to what we're dealing with right now. So, um, so the, the idea of like um, diaspora building, or like just, just people leaving Hong Kong, right, has become a, a theme in, in Canto Pop in 2021 and 2022, including that rubber band song. Uh, that was being brought up. I think um, the the historian in me want to want to say that there's a precedent to that um, between 1984 to circa 1989, a little little afterward. I mean, you you saw the first wave of Hong Kongers leaving Hong Kong because the joint declaration had been signed, and then obviously that was later accelerated after the Tiananmen Square massacre. Um, and in 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 Canto pop history, there was actually a moment when these themes were uh, prevalent in 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 music in from Hong Kong. Um, some of the, the the songs that I I can think about with with some resonance to Rubber Band today, you know, would include like "Gam Tin Yin Han Go Heng" by by Tat Ming Pair. For those of you who know, um, you know, there's a there's a song by Sally Yeah called called Jok Fok, um, or um, or Priscilla Chan Ye Gay. Or Tin Tin Could Go for those of you who, who know what I'm talking about. These were songs from the late 1980s um, that basically were about people saying goodbye or like people having to leave Hong Kong. Um, and it, they, they were not overtly political, um, but they alluded to the political context of Hong Kong, which was widespread anxiety about the future of the city um, ahead of the 1997 handover, um, you know, as, as Hong Kongers anticipated a transfer of sovereignty. Uh, from British to Chinese rule. And so I think, it, you know, as someone who has studied the sort of socio-political um, ramifications of, of Canto Pop, I, I, I would say, you know, what we are seeing right now um, ref do reflect the times. Now it's, it's, it's more difficult, of course, um, for musicians in Hong Kong to be a, a, you know, overtly political right now. I mean, the few of them, like Denise Ho, um, you know, is a good example. Um, 
you know, at, at best, their careers are, are trashed because they can't enter the Chinese market and they're shunned by record companies in Hong Kong. Um, at worst, they go to jail, right? So, 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 so that gets to what I want to, you know, how I want to sort of connect back to this talk, which is the idea of consumption versus production. Um, I think for that, you know, in diaspora building in the 1990s, 2000s, up until now, um, for Hong Kongers abroad, being able to listen to music from Hong Kong is one way to consolidate our identity. You know, I would I would go to this Alan Tam concert, you know, some years ago, and there would be like, you know, 10,000 people in Connecticut singing Alan Tam, which is which is kind of crazy. Um, or like, you know, or like karaoke bars in Chinatown, you know, in New York, uh, elsewhere in Queens, Flushing, whatever. Um, and, and those are ways where people abroad can consume cultural artifacts being produced in Hong Kong to consolidate our identity and to build diaspora. The challenge that we have right now in 2022 is that it is the production part, right? Because people have to self-censor or they're being censored in Hong Kong. So what we have to imagine in the, in the, in the era of the national security law is to shift the production from Hong Kong to abroad and shift the consumption back to Hong Kong. What that means is not just about um, cultural work, it's not about films or music, um, but also the production of knowledge. Um, you know, when we were trying to do Hong Kong studies or like when we were trying to research Hong Kong some years ago, what it really meant was to, was to translate a lot of these, you know, this research um, that is being produced in Hong Kong and explain to American academia like why this stuff matters. Like this, this was the process that I had myself gone through when I was applying to PhD programs and trying to make a case for why study Hong Kong history. Um, um, and that was difficult because you have to convince, basically convince American academics why studying Hong Kong history is important and why why you're not doing that in Hong Kong itself. Um, what is going to happen now is that we need to make sure because if you do Hong Kong studies in Hong Kong, you come to all kinds of different obstacles or dangers. How do you do Hong Kong research from abroad? How do you shift that production of knowledge from Hong Kong itself to abroad? You know, we see like the Cantonese program at Stanford. You know, the Hong Kong, the, the you know Hong Kong research being done at the at the US, University of California, right? The Hong Kong history program at, at, at Bristol University of Bristol in the UK, um, and and a lot of the Hong Kong studies uh, research coming out of UBC. I think what we what what we can anticipate is that um, increasingly ac academics who who remain in Hong Kong. Um, for obvious reasons, will will be less and less able to do that, um, and 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 we will have to do that from abroad, and 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 build our diaspora, you know, build our identity based on that, and translate that stuff back to Hong Kong. Hopefully, um, you know, Hong Kong is still, you know, the the, the you know, God knows what's going to happen five ten years from now. Um, you know, you know, may, maybe books will be banned in Hong Kong, right? Maybe that stuff cannot trickle back into Hong Kong. Um, but that stuff has to be done somewhere, you know, if we want to build diaspora. I, I can I can easily imagine, you know, uh, in the foreseeable future, there will be bands uh, who, who make canto pop songs from outside of Hong Kong. And Hong Kong listeners will listen to canto pop songs that are being recorded in London or New York or whatever, right? Or, or directors who are forced to leave Hong Kong, they will make films about Hong Kong or the Hong Kong diaspora from abroad for consumption in Hong Kong itself, if that is possible. And so I think I think these issues are all connected uh, and I've tried my best to connect them uh, in my capacity as a historian as an, and as an activist and I'll, I'll, I'll keep doing so. Thank you for such a thought provoking answer because I, I think your answer connects or maybe directly inspire this this question other question in the in the q a right now it's like how do we in our worlds materialize stand with hong kong without losing the local context so it, it, that is a constant anxiety of mine um because it, it, if we are you know an ethical qualitative researcher we always want to make sure that the research that we are doing is always in conversion with our research participants in, 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 in a local context. But right now, kind of what Jeffrey's saying, people either have to self-censor or if they're not censoring, partly because they have left what we consider to be like the local context, right? And, and so I think maybe I would want to 
reframe this question a little and think about kind of going off of Jeffrey's point, um, the production and consumption line is being swapped right now, or increasingly we'll imagine a future when that is the case. So can we also trouble what we consider to be the local context into thinking about the transnational context? So what does stand with Hong Kong mean in a transnational context when increasingly the people are not residing in just one specific locale of Hong Kong, but are creating different overlapping and also divergent com diasporic communities. Um, yeah, so maybe it's a cop out. I basically kind of just want to reframe the way that we think about local, global, and transnational. All right, it looks like we're on our final question. Uh, and Jeffrey mentioned that you think everyone should have thoughts on this. So I'm just going to make this visible right now. Um, feel free to hop on. Well, I, I, I think thinking about Lam Tao, like the, the, the whole discourse of Lam Tao, right? I, I, I think it, it, it sort of gets back to. Oh, sorry to interrupt. For anyone that doesn't speak Cantonese or doesn't understand this term, could you explain in like one sentence or two? The best translation of Lam Tao with popular cultural reference that I know of is if you burn, we, you know, it, it, what if we burn, you burn with us, right? Uh, so I, I, I think that, so that basically was sort of popularized in, in, in 2019, right? When, 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 you know, when there was the widespread crackdown on the protests, I think, uh, in, in increasingly large numbers of protesters decided that it made sense to bring Hong Kong down so the Chinese government or mainland China could not reap the benefits, mostly economic benefits, but also reputational and otherwise, um, uh, of Hong Kong while dismantling what made Hong Kong unique uh, in the first place. Um, I think it's... It 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 is 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 hard to. Why don't I say this? I think I I remember a moment when I was quite anti Lam Tao, and and I mean I'm I I, I won't say I'm a supporter. I'm I'm not an ad, you know like like an advocate of Lam Tao, but I I think it was, you know, the in the U.S. context, it was really about whether the U.S. should revoke um, differential treatment for economic and other purposes of Hong Kong from mainland China. You know, according to the U.S. Hong Kong Policy Act of 1992, um, and and we know that that was indeed uh, revoked by um, the former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in 2020. And I I think you know the idea of like revoking that sort of came about in 2018, 2019, and 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 I remember a time when I thought that that idea would not work, right? If 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 for the purposes of U.S policy making that the US would cease to see Hong Kong and China as two separate political entities that would that would actually create economic harm like people in Hong Kong would lose their jobs right and if if the US no longer even saw Hong Kong and China as different what would have been the foreign policy rationale to defend Hong Kong's autonomy right so i remember there was a time when it made no sense um i think increasingly people have sort of accepted that you know, if 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 we were to pin the blame on anyone for destroying Hong Kong, it would it would be the Chinese government and not anything that the protesters are even capable of doing, right? So I I, I think the the it 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 sort of shifted um, toward a sort of more quote unquote extreme direction as the movement went on and as it became clear that you know more moderate approaches would not work. Um, but it sort of links to what I was saying earlier about, you know, when I was answering that very, very difficult question on respectability, um, because there are, you know, there, 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 there are people in Hong Kong, again, on the front lines, and, 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 and I have tremendous respect for people who, who, who risk, right, basically their lives to do that, um, you know, and, 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 and they would look at us, like the fact that we are speaking English and not Cantonese right now, they would point to that as an example of elitism, right? They would, you know, when you say you support um, certain progressive issues in the context of the US, they point to that as being another example of you being elitist because you are being politically correct and you are not interested in being correct, right? So um, 
Lam Cha was one of those things. Again, I think increasingly that debate has sort of died down. Um, you know, it was a debate in 2018 and 2019 when 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 people were deciding, well, how how hard should you go on advocating? You know, um, sort of again, quote unquote, extreme positions when it came to um, Hong Kong and, and U.S. policy on Hong Kong. I think now is you know, I think most people would agree that it was an it was a necessity, despite all the. Um, difficult outcomes that it may have caused, that it was necessary for Hong Kong to take that hit. Um, and of course, unrelated to that, COVID-19 has also brought on a lot of um, um, economic trouble for Hong Kong, as we know, uh, ongoing right now. Um, but yeah, but like whether you supported Lam Tao used to be how you were being defined. Were you a- an elitist left hard who wanted to say all these things to sound nice or were you someone who were actually committed to um, to hurting the CCP, and that meant taking Hong Kong down with it, right? Um, yeah, I mean, it's 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 very very difficult, but um, but I think um, yeah, I'll, I'll see what others have to say about that. Uh, I'm aware of time, so I'll keep it brief. I just want to add that um, the the point about Lam Tao being an organizing principle that somehow demarcate somebody from being a loyal movement supporter to someone who is like just chit-chatting in the ivory tower. Uh, so Francis Lee, I think, you know, now probably people know him as a social scientist who testified in court on the first, uh, the NSO trial. Um, he had a paper that he analyzed solidarity slogans in the movement and and for slogans such as like, you know, Heng Dai Pasan, you know, brothers climb mountains together, each in a different way. So, so you kind of analyze these kind of solidarity slogans and lamps. How is kind of one of those principles that congeal different Hong Kong movement supporters together? And his argument is that yes, on the one hand, it's really useful in bolstering solidarity and morale. But on the other hand, the more insidious side is that it can also stifle deliberation. So when somebody was like, I don't know about that. I have questions about certain movement ideologies and tactics. They can easily be tacked as like, you must not be loyal enough and hence you're criticizing or even having legitimate questions about it. So I think there's always two sides of this coin of solidarity, but the question is like, how can we remain in solidarity but still hold a critical edge so that we can ask these necessary questions? To add on what Jeffrey and, and Sharon talked about, like I think what I could uh, relate to the idea of concept of, of Lam Chao is Lam Chao, uh, there's never a consensus on the, the meaning of Lam Chao. So, 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 so everyone would interpret Lam Chao in their own ways. And, and, and that's why like, it is like really weak and a fleeting concept that, that folks might interpret it uh, like, well, differently in different contexts. And, and, and what, like how, how does that concept and principle translate into concrete strategy? I think that also differ uh, among like different activists and, and different camps. Like even, even among the same ideological camp in Hong Kong, they might also have different preferences on like, well, what the external parties should be doing, what kind of critical China policy should they adopt? Uh, should they simply like, well, terminate uh, the special status enjoyed by Hong Kong, as Jeffrey mentioned, or should they like well send in troops uh, to liberate Hong Kong, or should they like well change uh, their foreign relation uh, 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 policy like concerning China, uh, like in the near term and in the future, so that the China uh, so that the Chinese economy would crumble, and then like well they might be able to anticipate like a change one day in the future. And they might be able to write on that change and, and to see like well a democratic Hong Kong and democratic China. Uh, so folks have like radically different ideas uh, concerning how to like well activate that strategy, that concept, and, and to make that like materialized. So uh, uh, so I do feel like it just makes sense that like well folks disagree uh, on the the very meaning of the concept and hence acting uh, differently. Like uh, one last remark I would say would be like, well, even for folks who got arrested uh, last year because of their participation in the primary election, like those folks, like those like 47 people uh, who are like being prosecuted, like more than 47 people actually involved in that case, uh, like while well, being persecuted, like, but those folks who are being persecuted, uh, prosecuted 
going after the name, the charges of like subverting a state because of their involvement in the primary election back in 2020. Like, like even among those 47 people, even the most radical wing, uh, uh, like the, the folks who, who, who brand themselves as uh, the camp of resistance, they might disagree on the idea of Lam Chao and, and how the idea would get translated in Hong Kong's movement. So I think that, 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 that divergence, that, that uh, really conflicting ideas or convoluted concept is exactly like the way uh, and, and, and reason why like, well, folks could not settle down on some, some debate within the movement. And when the pandemic hit, it just like further fracture, like, well, uh, like, well, uh, uh, like the social movement and the pro-democracy camp on what's the best strategy moving forward, like after the 2019 movement. All right, so we are about time. Uh, thank you everyone in the audience for submitting questions and sticking with us for two whole hours. Uh, lovely patience from everybody. Thank you so much to our speakers. And I originally did have a slot for closing remarks, but I think that would be cruel and unusual punishment. But uh, I'm really, really happy that we're able to have this panel and have this conversation. Um, I think we did a cool and quirky topic and uh, talking about this uh, combination, which is honestly like hard to find when you're uh, doing work abroad and every other event seems to be a rally, right? But it's nice to have a bit of variety and add a sprinkle of chaos when you talk about respectability politics. But I hope everyone had a good time today. We have some clunky like screen recordings and audio recordings somewhere that we're trying to throw together. But we'll see how that goes. I have no idea if anything is usable. 